Exodus chapter number 17. Exodus chapter number 17. Start reading in verse 1. Good to have our visitors today. We're glad you're here. Hope that they'll be good to you around here. Good to see some of our folks that haven't been able to come for a while back with us this morning. Exodus 17, and all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses, and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us, and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do? Unto this people they be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. When you journey through the desert, there's more than one time you'll run out of water. Water is a very precious commodity. It's important. And here we see that the children of Israel had ran out of water. I can't imagine how hard that would be to be in Death Valley with no water. And yet they they chided with Moses. And well, let's see what happens here. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning for the privilege of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and supplying our needs. And oh, dear God, I pray today that you'd help our people some of them in sorrow today. Father, they need the touch of God, and I pray that you'd help them today. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we go to preach. Father, may our preaching be anointed with the power of God. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to help somebody. In Jesus' name, amen. Water is a very important commodity. Jesus one time sat on the well of Samaria and waited on a woman to come and get her a drink of water. And he started a conversation with her that day. And he started simply by telling her about a river that'll never run dry. A place where we'll never have a need for water again. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17 has been known to be the very last invitation in the Bible. The very last invitation that God gave. And He said, To him that's a thirst, let him come. And whosoever will, let him come. And drink of the water of life freely. That's God's invitation. There are no strings attached. God has went to great lengths to satisfy our thirst. Now the children of Israel had been initiated by the commandment of God to journey further into the wilderness and the further they got, the drier it got and it got to where there was no water for the people to drink. God let Moses, or led Moses to lead them where there was nothing to eat. Lead them where there was nothing to drink. You say, God wouldn't do that. God did that. Amen. And if you're a Christian, you'll experience those times in your life when you don't have nothing to eat 
and nothing to drink. Now I'm not talking about physical food. I'm talking about you'll dry up spiritually and you'll need a drink of water from God's well. But Moses had faith that evidently they didn't have. Uh, he latched on to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19 that says uh, uh, God will supply your needs. Probably nobody else had figured out that God would supply their needs. Uh, it takes a great confidence in your pastor uh, and that confidence will soon wear thin when you quit seeing anything. Yeah. Amen. We're kind of a sight-oriented people. Yeah. Yeah. And if it, we don't see anything, we don't have any water to drink or any food to eat. We kind of get sore to preacher. Yeah. And they... Bible said, wherefore the people did chide with Moses. I can hear somebody now, well, I don't think Moses is doing it right. Yeah. Uh, I believe if Moses was really a preacher from God, he wouldn't fix us in a place where we wouldn't have any water. Yeah. Or grandma didn't do it that way. Yeah. Uh, why does he want to do it that way? One fellow said, preacher, you're not feeding me. Well, Maybe I'm not supposed to. Maybe I'm supposed to skin you. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> we'll just think that for a minute. Yeah. But Exodus in 17 and chapter 2, or, or I'm sorry, chapter 17, verse 2, uh, to chide with Moses was to tempt the Lord. Yeah. You see that? Yeah. Whenever they were bad mouthing Moses, they were actually bad mouthing God right. because God's the one that led Moses Amen. to lead them where they were. I, and I think that, that it, we'd be best to, to just keep our mouth off of the man of God. That's right. That's right. I think they'd have been better off if they'd have... You know, David was a great man. But one thing I admire about him, he kept his mouth off the man of God. Amen. I don't think he was a Baptist for that reason. But I remember that uh, uh, he, had, and he had every right. Do you agree? He had every right to depose old Saul. Because yeah. Saul was one of those glory hogs that Mark was talking about this morning, wanting to build a name for himself. Yeah. Saul was a glory hog. Saul was a jealous ruler. Saul was just basically a bad king. Yeah. And several times God worked it out, circumstances worked out, where David could have got rid of Saul. But he said, I'm not going to. I remember Abishai, was he, I think he was, was he Joab's brother? I'd have to go back and look. But, but I remember that uh, Abishai, uh, uh, they were in the same cave that Saul was in. And, and he turned to David and he said, hey David, you won't even have to do it. All you got to do is let me at him. And all I need to hit him one time and, and your kingdom will be set up. Everything you want will be yours if you'll just let me at him. And David said, it's not my place. Uh, who can stretch forth their hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? That's right. Man, that took a lot of grace on That's David's right. part. Amen. A lot of grace there. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you, for they watch for your souls. Right. Now, most preachers have your well-being at heart. They're not trying to badmouth you and just give you a rough time. They're trying to fix it so whenever you enter heaven, you can enter there without being ashamed. Right. But a lot of times they'll get badmouthed because of the problem, the circumstances that's going on. And here Israel is badmouthing Moses because they have no, no water to drink. Wasn't long ago they were singing redemption song and and they were just shouting the praises of God and, and the praises of Moses at the Red Sea. Wasn't long ago that they were doing that. But they soon forget and turn out of the way. And they forgot that God's the one Amen. that had made their provision so far. And if God's took care of us so far, I'm persuaded he'll finish taking care of us. The uh, ecclesiastical preacher uh, said that these things operate in cycles. Have you ever noticed that? They operate in seasons. And he said there in one place there is a time and a place 
for everything. John the Baptist had a season. Y'all remember? They rejoiced for John's preaching for a season. But then when he got too rough on the king, uh, they cut his head off. And and his season, I'm assuming, ended there. If you really want to see that cycle in progress, go to the book of Judges. The book of Judges will have an enforcement to that cycle. And it goes something like this. The glory of God is in the place uh, and and then the people get in a tentative to worship in God according to His instructions. And once they get in a tentative and letting things slip, Directly they get to where they're apathetic. They don't pay a whole lot of attention to it. And then from apathy they go to apostasy. And from apostasy they go to captivity. And from captivity they have no place to go but to cry on God again. And God delivers them and the glory comes again. That seems to be a cycle. That works in churches. That works in nations. That works in states. We'll give glory to God as this country has uh, and then we'll get to where we're in a and we let somebody like this Madeline Murray O'Hare or her ill come in and, and steal prayer right out from under our nose. Uh, next thing you know, uh, we say, well, it doesn't really matter as long as things works good for me and I got a good salary uh, and we go into apostasy. We deny God and make no mistake, captivity's coming uh, and we'll have to again cry out, Lord, you're the only only one that can deliver us. That's the cycle. Now if I look at this record in place, and no doubt in my mind that it was barren. No doubt in my mind that water was a huge problem or no water was a huge problem there. And I will say this, that Christianity will have thirst that the world cannot feel. Oh, you think you can fill it up with all of the things that this world offers, but they will never never quench your thirst. The Bible said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They'll be filled. But whenever we fill our barns and we got our barns full, uh, we have a tendency to say, Well, I still need some stuff. And so we'll tear down that barn and build a bigger barn, a greater barn. And we'll say, well, I still need some stuff. Yeah. And we'll go down there to the Urena space and I can't imagine, I just can't imagine why in the world people would rent a space to store junk. <laughs> why don't you have a yard sale? Amen. <laughs> Sell the whole yard. <laughs> How am I doing here? <laughs> I, I like that. I just wanted to No, I don't have any rent a space down there at, at the locker place. You know what I'm talking about? Just to store my barn, just to store my junk. I gotta have a bigger barn. But I'm telling you, you'll keep on wanting a bigger barn. You'll keep on wanting a bigger barn. You'll keep on wanting a bigger barn until one day you'll say, well, I got all I need. And that night your soul will be required of you and you'll lose it all anyway. So what's the point in even having it? That's sad. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. You can't fill that hunger for righteousness with automobiles. You can't fill it with campers or boats or or whatever else that this old world would lure before you uh, try to get you into their trap. How many times has God already delivered us and yet we doubt Him? The pitiful condition of our heart that we would doubt Him and doubt His love. I was thinking of the Sunday school lesson there this morning, and Mark said that they Hebrews or Genesis eleven four. He said they were going to make us a name. Yeah. Let's make us a name. Yeah. My mind went to Philippians chapter two, where it said Jesus, in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made Himself of no reputation. He, did, he, he took a lower name 
And, and because he took that lower name and was faithful even unto death, I like this part, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. These fellows were out there in the desert and they were, they were uh, uh, thirsting for water and began to look sad. It began to look hopeless. And I think somebody hollered for the preacher's daughter and said, will you sing that song? She said, what song is that? He said, God delivers again. God will do it again. God's able to supply our needs. Uh, when will we ever learn that God's grace is sufficient? Man, we ought to just be shouting to the hilltop. God's grace is sufficient. Through all of the trouble and all of the Ebenezer's that we've came to so far, God's grace is sufficient. Uh, uh, God did not uh, uh, look up, my friend, and say, oh my goodness, uh, I've led these people out here where there's no water. I didn't know that. You know, we'll sit around and, and how many of you have asked the Lord like I have, oh, didn't you know where you was putting me? I didn't know that Revedon was a, a dry, desolate place. Or could it be, my friend, that God had another purpose in leading them out there? Why do we have desert places? Well, I'm going to give you seven things, and I don't know that this is all of them. I don't know that this is in order. I didn't get this from another preacher. got this out of the Bible. But I'm going to give you seven things. I think, number one, that God puts us in that dry, barren place so that we'll understand how inadequate we are in ourselves. That we cannot supply our own needs. That we're going to have to depend on something other than us. Other than our ability, other than our mind, other than our skill, it's going to have to be something greater than us if we get delivered out of this place. Then I think number two, uh, that God puts us in dry places so that Satan will fall over his own accusation. You remember whenever the dry place came to Job, Satan said, you let me at him and I'll have him cussing before the sun goes down. He didn't. He don't know it all. He thinks he can. He thinks himself to be something when be honest with you, he's nothing. Oh, he's our enemy. Don't get no mistake about that. But listen, he falls over his own plan. He falls in his own trap. 